I actually texted him the other day. I was like, hey, when are we hitting 500? Because I want to do, I think we should do something cool. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, Fred's like, I'm going to show up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some fireworks. I show up. This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. Long before there was Instagram and TikTok influencers, YouTubers, and even podcasters, there were writers. And I'm not talking about bloggers, but esteemed authors and journalists who dug into a story and took it to magazines and other trade publications. But the times have changed. Our attention spans have gotten a lot shorter, and now running a story, it looks a lot different. And to help give more insight into whiskey journalism, we've invited Maggie Kimbrell back on the show. She's the content editor of American Whiskey Magazine and writes some of the most intriguing stories in bourbon today. We all evaluate how access to distilleries has gotten a lot harder through PR firms and how there may be a dilution of valuable content and talent because the barrier to entry is so much lower just because of social media now. But it's not all doom and gloom. We are now in a time when there is more to talk about than ever in bourbon. And there's going to be no shortage of new stories with the boom of so many new distilleries and entrants into the market. With that, enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Alan Channel, who writes me on fredminnick.com. Who are the main and most significant lobbying groups in the United States regarding whiskey and bourbon? Well, that's a very interesting question. That's not just inside baseball. That's like inside the dugout. This is a super high-level question. And there's one main lobby. There's a lot of other splinter groups out there. But for the entire industry, there's one main group, and it's called Discus Distilled Spirits Council of the United States. They have been around for a, a long time, and they were back in like the 40s and 50s. They were actually referred to as the Bourbon Institute. They changed their name, but they were behind a lot of things to include making bourbon to be a unique product of the United States in 1964. They were kind of behind like the whole campaign of uh, crowning Elijah Craig as the father of bourbon. They, you know, early on they were... They were basically just all the wealthy executives kind of getting together, trying to make a more equal playing field for the industry that, you know, kind of get the same treatment as beer and wine. And today they have become an integral part of Washington, D.C. Like they help put on like the Bourbon Caucus, which is a, a bipartisan, you know, get together. Democrats, Republicans are there. And things are always testy politically, but they tend to show up and have a bourbon and, you know, I keep it polite. I've actually never been to that. I've been invited a couple times, but I've never been to it. But I've I've seen them in action. I've seen them get meetings. You know, they get meetings with the vice president. They get meetings with the presidential staffs. Anytime there is a tariff or some kind of threat against the distilled spirits world, whether it be health organizations claiming that if you drink whiskey, you're going to die tomorrow, or if there is a, a state that is trying to move forward to banning alcohol sales in a county or whatever, they, they get involved and they're very, very strong uh, across the country. It's a, it's a strong lobby. I wouldn't say they're like stronger than like big oil or anything like or tech, but they're they're strong enough. They definitely have a presence in the United States of America. They kind of fragment out after that. So that's those are like the big companies. And the big companies like Brown Foreman, Diageo, Pernod Ricard, Constellation, companies like that, they also have their own lobbying firms that are very particular for their own interests. So there's a lot of lobbying going on by the big companies. But the smaller ones, there are two main ones that exist that kind of represent their interest. Uh, American Distillers Institute, and that's called ADI. And they tend to be they tend to be more about like how to get started, how to navigate through your local laws and things like that. They're more, I would say they're probably more for that new craft distiller kind of coming up. 
but ACSA, the American Craft Spirits Association. Now, this is a very formidable lobbying group that will go through Congress, will go through the Senate. Uh, they'll go after like state lobby groups and they'll also work, or, or state senates and so forth. They'll also work very closely with discus on, on laws that pertain to uh, craft whiskey. But at times they will get, you know, they will be at the opposite ends of the aisle because ACSA is strictly about protecting the little guy and discus can tend to be about Pernod Ricard and Diageo and Brown Foreman and people like that. But they typically do work together. I think the ACSA is one of the major reasons why you see laws changing all across the country to benefit smaller distillers. So they're very, very active. And, you know, in the heart of bourbon country in Kentucky, you got the Kentucky Distillers Association, which has been around since 1880. And they're more of a they're more of a state lobby. And so they work on like uh, they just I mean, they're always up to something. But they have uh, one bill a year that'll go through the Kentucky House and Senate and you know, usually get signed by the governor. Most recently, they end up getting a barrel tax repealed over a, a lengthy amount of time. It's been on the books for really for most of the 20th century and, and all of the 21st century. So they're, they're all about protecting the interests of, of their membership. And so all of these are about like companies paying membership dues to a trade organization, and those trade organizations have the interest of their members. That was a great question, Alan. And again, that was inside inside baseball. And I hope that it kind of helped you understand a little bit of the political formations out there in the whiskey world. Because again, this is not tech. It's not the automobile industry or the oil industry. But you know what? We probably, whiskey's probably got a bigger foothold in the world than the cardboard lobby. I don't know why I brought up the cardboard lobby. Maybe because I'm looking at a box. That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. If you want to be like Alan, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. Click the contact button. And if I like the idea, I'll read it on the air. Till next week. Cheers. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout, and if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable gaming license ORG 0002703. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina, drink responsibly, and be 21. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Knows Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. 
So head on over to knowsyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Welcome back, everybody. It's another brand new episode of Bourbon Pursuit coming at you. I'm Kenny. I'm Ryan. Fred Minnick here. And we're trying a new thing here. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the news. Yeah. I don't know how well that went. Yeah. We'll go well, with people it. People always just like, who do I know what's talking? I've never heard of this Fred Minnick guy before. And so people got to have some sort of recognition with the voice. Uh, yeah. There yeah. We go. That's what it is. But this is going to be another great episode as we, we kind of dive into American whiskey journalism. Now, we think about what today's modern consumer and how they consume media, it's a lot different than what it was 10 years ago. There's just a big, vast array of ways that you can consume things, and you're doing it through the form of a medium of podcasting right now, long-form interviewing. And before this ever existed, there was also magazines, there were blogs, there were online subscriptions, there were newsletters. There was actually also physical newsletters. I think that, what, Chuck Cowdery Potentially, yeah, used still to, has used to mail the out. Bourbon Country Reader going exactly, yeah. and there are a thing called books to people. Oh, yeah, forgot about <laughs> these. Uh, <laughs> yes, Barnes and Noble still thanks yes. you for your your contribution there. <laughs> yeah, but this is really what we're going to dive into, and so of course everybody knows Fred. Fred's been a longtime journalist, but we also want to invite our old friend Maggie Kimbrell on the show. So Maggie, she said she's old. Not that she's been old. friends we've for just been... a while, <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you why I've been friends for a while is because not only is she the content editor for American Whiskey Magazine. She's also the chair of the World Whiskey Awards North America. She's also et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But she has also been a previous guest back on episode 007. Right? Wow. I remember Double that. Seven. Yes. I remember this because Kenny did a Jefferson's pick right before it. I think, and you came in feeling pretty saucy, <laughs> feeling pretty. <laughs> you good. remember that? I do remember oh, that because we were in like uh, right office. office, yeah, Hirschborn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It just flashed in my memory. Wow, you got a great memory. Yep, I'm not surprised it's, you don't remember that one. Probably <laughs> Jefferson's pick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but she was also back on episode zero five one or episode fifty one that we had with Nino Marchetti from the Whiskey Wash, and she was mm-hmm. on there as well. I think Michael Veach was on there too. So. Maggie, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here again finally. What no, what number episode are we on now? I mean, you're in the 200s or something now. Right? Oh, We're about no, to no, be no. at five and, 500 soon. Holy cow. Yeah, I was like, I think this will be in the 470 to 480 realm, something like wow. that. So, I actually yeah. texted him the other day. I was like, hey, when are we hitting 500? Because I want to do, I think we should do something cool. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Fred's like, I'm going to show up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Bring some fireworks. I show up. Yeah. Bring some fireworks or something. <laughs> but no, I think this is going to be really fun because Maggie and Fred uh, come from the, uh, I, sorry, excuse my language, the old school world when we start talking about the journalism side of things. and But it's not to say that- Where you it, need to know how to use grammar. And a typewriter. Yeah. But the other thing about it is- <laughs> <laughs> I have a typewriter. Do you have a typewriter? I have a typewriter, okay. yeah. <laughs> There we uh, go. I knew that. I would yeah. love- Do you know world. what Google Drive is? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to just go to typewriter. Yeah. You got typewriters, yeah. we got ring lights. That's, right? Right. That's right. the big difference. But I think this will be fun as we kind of dive in and try to look at sort of like the evolution and the growth of, of really where- journalism in American whiskey and bourbon has really changed because we've talked about it before extensively on the show, especially when Fred brings up some of those old stories of, you know, you all used to have pretty insane access to distilleries Mm -hmm. where, you know, there was a very, it was a small pocket of people. And I guess that's probably where we should start off is like some of the, the OGs in this world is like, like how small of the community was there in bourbon journalism? Oh, good Lord. So I, I, I'll take a step back and kind of give you just a little arc of like kind of how it all started. You know, whiskey journalism did not exist outside of trades until the 90s. And that was when Whiskey Magazine and then Malt Advocate, later renamed Whiskey Advocate, started. And they were mostly focused on scotch. But there was one guy who kind of built his like legacy around American whiskey. They didn't want anything to do with, with, with scotch. And that's Chuck Cowdery, whom I consider to be our godfather of American whiskey writing. And he had a blog and just went after it, was very active on straightbourbon.com, which existed before Facebook and is where people kind of hung out. But from the 90s to, I'd say, 2005, it was just Malt Advocate, Whiskey Magazine, Chuck Cowdery, and a handful of other bloggers out there. And that's kind of when I came onto the scene. 
I started writing about bourbon in 2006 for anybody who would let me. And it just kind of, kind of evolved, but that was, there was, you talk about access, like, they were just the bourbon brands were just excited that anybody would want to talk to them about anything. And I'd ask them questions about yeast. And five hours later I would have, I'd have dinner with Jim Rutledge after just a single question of like about, about yeast. It was, but it was very, you're like, you came in what, 2010, 2000? Uh, I think it was about 20, 2012, 2013. Okay. Yeah. I just had my 10th anniversary of the first bourbon right story on. that I published right in on. December. Yep. Yeah, because I remember, like, I wrote Whiskey Women, and that's when I, I met you right around the time yeah. I, my book Whiskey Women was coming out. Yep. So, and I've I've watched your career, and I have been I've been very impressed with what you've done. Very proud of you. Like, I I've recommended you to uh, Whiskey Magazine. Yep. Long time ago to, to start writing for when I was the contributing editor, you probably hate me for that recommendation. No, I, <laughs> but, yeah. I that was I. I always, whenever I get an opportunity to to talk about the people who have helped me along the way, you're always at the top of the list. I mean, it's you, it's Michael Veach, uh, those are really the top two people who have you know helped me out getting to where I am now. So I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you've got talent, and I think most importantly, like. It is not easy to navigate this space yeah. and to ask questions that distillers don't roll their eyes at, you know, and that's the, and that's something I, I saw in you very early on is that you ask good questions and that's where, what it is more than anything. It's just asking good questions because you get, you get the appropriate answers out of it. But, Besides, what's your mash bill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, if you come at it, if you come at them like fangirls or fanboys, you're never going to get anywhere. But if you ask Chris Morris a, a hard hitting question, he'll respect you more for it, and you'll get and you'll get better answers, and then probably some some mud along the way and uh, <laughs> competitors. But yeah, it is crazy where we are now. Yeah, you yeah, know? it is. But you know, there's something interesting that I wanted to say about access because this is something that I've been thinking about actually a lot lately. One of the things that I'm seeing that I I don't know if this is a canary in the coal mine, but I feel like it's getting harder to have access now. You know, like people that I used to be able to, you know, like I I have a Rolodex of master distillers in my contact. That's not a humble brag or anything. I mean, like these are, you right. used to just be able to call them. And, you know, now everything is so clamped down and so strictly controlled. It's really hard to get that same level of access that we had that really, you know, helped us build these careers. And that is starting to concern me a little bit because, it feels like, you know, part of the bourbon boom was people like us going in and finding these really interesting story angles and talking about things that nobody else was talking about because we had that access and we could go in and do that. These days, if I call up a distillery and I'm like, hey, I want to do X, Y, Z, I want to do a story. Oh, well, we'll have to run it past the legal department or the marketing department or blah. And I'm like, yeah. what, what, are you, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not asking for you to, like, sign an oath in blood giving me your firstborn child. Like, I'm asking to yet, give you exposure <laughs> to, you know, the, th the cool things that I think you're doing at, at this brand. So that's something that I'm really concerned about for the long term viability of the whiskey media, because I'm starting to see a lot of these, especially the big brands. Now, the craft brands, I can still like walk into any distillery and be like, show me your stills. Show me where'd you get these made? Right. Show me, you know, show me the grains you're using. Where are you grinding your corn? Blah, 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 you know. But the larger distilleries, it, it seems like they've been propelled to the top and now they're like almost kind of afraid that they're going to lose that position. And so there's a lot more caution going into what they're willing to entertain. Yeah, and I know exactly where it came from. It comes from when you were starting out, when I was starting out, they were all just trying to build a pie, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make the pie bigger. Now, they, now they've got the pie so big, they're fighting over their individual pieces. Yeah. And if if something cannot be directly correlated to a case sale or opening mm. a new market, they don't want to do it. And right. they and I've talked to the brands. You know, when I started when I started Bourbon Plus, it was it one of the one of the questions was like, how is your market different than ours? And I remember I remember that coming up to me, and mm. I was like, that's a weird fucking question. Yeah, you know, because I was like, you know, I'm an independent voice. This magazine is an independent voice. You guys are our brands, and the old guard who respects that and appreciates that—they're on their way out. Yeah, they're on their way out, and they don't care. They want, 
what the generation crossing T's and dotting I's want right now. They want cells. They want to look big. And I think a really good example of that is is whistle pig. Mm. Whistle pig. This has not. This has never happened to me. I have a good relationship with whistle pig. They're they're fine. But I I was told by and media is also very connected to events. Yeah. And there was a there's an event planner. The guy had a brand and is like. You know, they won't come to my event because I have a brand. And it's like that like never would have happened, you know, 15 years ago yeah. for like this enormous event that this guy was putting on. But there are also so many more events now. Yeah. You know, when we were starting this, it was Whiskey Live. Whiskey Fest. Whiskey Fest. World Whiskies. That was it. And then, well, and I guess uh, Bourbon Classic was just starting around that yeah. time as well. And I mean, that was pretty much it. Now it's like. Every city has a whiskey festival and there are multiple whiskey festivals. And that's another thing that's kind of contributing to the watering down of the, you know, pool of available talent and dollars and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, we've definitely noticed that as when we have our own brand of trying to get people staffed at all these different whiskey festivals. Everywhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're taking a step back in 24 because we just did too many last year. And it's sure. like we just saw the dollars. We didn't really see anything really come out of it so it's just yeah. about people looking for return on investment yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly so we, we should I say we're still doing some but we're doing the ones that felt like we got the most value out of them whatever but yeah. but it, it is we're, we are at a place we are at a place where these brands are building their their own thing mm-hmm. and if you're if and they have a ship and they have a destination. And they have the narrative. They it, the Exactly. Yeah. And if you happen to be on that way and it can help it with their narrative or their destination, then you're going to be a part of it. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll bring you in. But other than that, and then, and that's like, and that's where we come in. You know, yeah. I've developed sources within those warehouses that tell me the truth. You've developed sources in, in the distilleries that tell you the real story. And that's, and that's what whiskey journalism is, is like being able to, to tell someone what's really happening that the brand will not. And one of the big moments for me in doing that was when I revealed where Michter's was getting made by, by Brown Foreman mm. in like 2013 or whatever it was. Oh, how dare you? And that was, you I know, mean, a long time ago. Offense. That's not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But back then, that was like, you know, earth shattering. Yeah, it was earth shattering. Yeah. It was it was sure. thought to be, but I had evidence, and right. it was like, yeah. you know, and that it's that sort of thing that that separates us. And where we are now, the evolution of all this, people don't read like they used to. Yeah, they just want instant information. And what is is more attractive to a brand? is to go through an influencer who has 100,000, 200,000 followers. And then they have control of the messaging. They have control of the messaging. Yeah. And I get, I mean, we have large followings and I get hit up all the time from brands when they're social coordinators, whatever they are. And they're like, hey, we'll send you a bottle for this. And I actually have told them to fuck off before. <laughs> As well you should. I mean, like, I, I think that, you know, we're it, it's, it's shocking to me still at this point in time where people are like, hey, can I send you a bottle in, you know, it, it, if you can guarantee X, Y, Z coverage? And I'm like, no, no. Like, why? <laughs> yeah. No, that's not what I do. Number one. Number two, like people die from exposure. They don't pay bills with it. Mm-hmm. Um, So like it's shocking to me that that's a thing that's so common. I mean, it happens all the time. Well, the other thing about it is as well as I think a lot of people also violate the rules because you're supposed to put hashtag ad even if you get a bottle for free. Right. And most people don't. And I think that's one of those things that, yeah, we've been on the other receiving end of that. If somebody said like, oh, we'll send you a bottle in return for X. I'm like, we're not going to guarantee you anything. Like if we put on a whiskey quickie, it's because we want to be able to talk about it. It's not because, plus, you know, as well as anybody else, I'm sure you do, Maggie, it's like you get so many bottles in the mail, there's only so much that you can get to anyway. Right. So you've got to be kind of picky and choosy. And and I've I've actually out of self-defense, like I, I do not, as a general rule, do whiskey reviews. And I made that decision like probably eight, nine years ago because people kept coming to me being like, hey, can you review this? Can you? And I'm just like, this is going to easily get out of control, number one. Number two, like, there are so many people doing all of these reviews. Why do they also need my review? And so just out of self-defense, I made the decision early on, like, there's there's really no reason for me to do whiskey reviews because, you know, like, everybody else is doing them. And yeah. 
it's just there are too many. There are too many to reveal. Well, even yeah. ten years ago, actually, there wasn't that many. Today, well, yeah, today, there, there might be a lot. There, there was enough, but you know, you you asked like how many writers were there? There were Lou Bryson, one of my mentors, and I. We did the math in two thousand, I think sixteen, and there were fifteen what we consider to be professional whiskey writers in the world. And I don't think that number has grown too much. There's a lot of whiskey content creators and people like that, but sure. the actual hardcore writers. Yeah. And I, I mean, we are a dying breed because writing is not how people get their information about whiskey anymore. I mean, they. I hope they read Brian Hara's book on bourbon justice and get the deep content from Michael Veach in Kentucky bourbon. It, and I hope they, they, they pick up books and learn, but the, the fact is they do get more quickly from a TikTok guy. Yeah. yeah. But there, I mean, but I think bourbon grew because of that, those stories, those r- romantic, you know, like that were only brought to you by whiskey writers, but now it seems like distilleries have brought it in house every release. You know, we read them every week. They they all do their own press releases now. You know they come out and they throw it through Jet GPT and come out with all these fancy buzzwords and this and that. Well, you know, whereas you used the... to learn about all the stuff from people like you all, it being an article or a but still, newsletter. Uh, but a lot of times too, like our information would originate from the distilleries. Yeah, and I, Amy Presky, I said er, a long time ago that she was the best whiskey writer in the business because people would just copy and paste her Sazerac or Buffalo Trace releases. Yeah. And nobody would know the difference because she did not write those like brandy, you know, not brandy like the spirit, but like brand centric press releases. She was yeah. like, came from warehouse, I, H, barrel proof this. I mean, they were like juicy details. Yeah. And great. and going back to, you know, our conversation earlier, when Amy Presky left Buffalo Trace, I mean, I have difficulty reaching anybody at Buffalo Trace now. You know, that's part yeah. of that, you know, kind of the churn of people leaving and doing other things and, and newer people coming in. And we're losing a lot of those connections that we had built that, you know, got us all that kind of information to begin with. Yeah. I guess another question I'll, I'll kind of throw to you, Maggie, is like, when when did you all see this sort of like this shift kind of happening? Whereas when, as part of the old guard of people that really focused on American whiskey and, you know, really took it to heart and writing really deep and interesting articles versus people that are writing for usatoday.com. And I think the, the one headline that, of course, caught like, I know this is coming out and it's going to be way off base for probably timeline purposes. But when the Chris Stapleton released whiskey came out and they're like, this newest bourbon is from is not as smooth as Tennessee whiskey, but it's from Kentucky. And it's like, there's so much wrong in that headline. Yeah. <laughs> and, but like, but that's moving towards like USA Today and GQ and Forbes and whatever. So it's like, how do you how do you go from something that's just very, very whiskey focused to something that just like basically takes mainstream? That's that's really a great question. And I feel like that's something that has always happened because, you know, when you look at these press releases, they're usually wish lists from from the distillery or from, you know, the the PR team. Like we really want them to focus on this. So we're going to write this press release in a certain way so that they'll focus in on this one thing. I got one recently. It was Michael Buble invented a new category of, of whiskey. And I was like, the TTB would like to have a word with Michael Buble, I'm sure. But this was, you know, like I understand where that comes from, right? That was somebody in a PR firm saying, oh, I've never heard of this thing personally myself, so it must be brand new. And Michael Buble must be the per- not. I'm, try- I'm not trying to shit on Michael Buble here. I'm sure he's a lovely person. I'm sure he also had nothing to do with that press release or has no idea like what the... No, his team would have though. Well, yeah, you would yeah. hope so, right? Yeah. But the, it, it was a it was a wish list from his PR team saying like, "Oh, Michael Bublé invented a new category of whiskey," and I was just like, "Who would print that without questioning it?" And then you go and you look at the Google search results, and there are people just like repasting yeah. uh, the press releases, or like, "Oh my God, Michael Bublé invented a new category of whiskey," or whatever. And I'm just like. This is not how this works, you know, and so I think that that and that's a recent example, but I've seen this a whole lot, you know, like there have always been people, you know, there have always been these headlines and these, you know, people who are like more general journalists get a hold of these things and they're like, oh, that sounds neat. And then, you know, like they don't really have the background to be able to parse out, you know, the the 
meaning of what's being said and like what's accurate, what's not accurate. They don't really know what to question. And so, you know, it's 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 something that has happened as long as I've been paying attention in this space, right? I mean, there there are always going to be like there have always been stories where it's Business Insider or Forbes or whatever and I'm just like why don't they get somebody who knows what they're talking about to write this? You know, that was a big frustration for me. And then, you know, it it all comes down to money. Like they're not going to pay a freelancer to write it when they can get a staff writer to regurgitate yeah. a press release. It just doesn't work that way. Well, I, I will add to that. I mentioned at the top that I would write for anybody who would let me about bourbon. And, you know, early in my career, I was a freelance writer and I would pitch magazine stories and I picked up a pretty regular gig with Scientific American mm. and and was breaking down science of, of whiskey. I think in part, it is easier to get a, a staff writer to, to bring things down. But I also don't think there is a lot of people out there with, with an intent focus of writing about high level, either business or science. I mean, Clay Risen does a great job. He does a great job with the New York Times sure. when, he, when he does it or elsewhere. You know, when I was actively with Forbes, I would try to do the same. But you would see you would see the numbers in terms of what people would read. Yeah. And they don't give a two shits about the science or or some of the business side of it. They just want to know what tastes good. Sure. And that, and that is and I'll never forget. Marvin Schenken, I had a meeting with Marvin Schenken when I was Whiskey Advocate. We were going back and forth about the stories I wanted to write. Make you sure know. you set the stage for people who don't know what like Schenken News Daily is okay. as well. So I used to be the, the lead reviewer for Whiskey Advocate. Schenken is a company that owns Cigar Aficionado, Wine Spectator, and Whiskey Advocate. He bought it from John Hansel way back when I turned it from Malt Advocate to Whiskey Advocate. And he was trying to bring me in as the editor, editor at large. And this is when I was eventually going to start my own magazine. Because in my mind, the only way to do what I do was through writing and magazines. And even though I had people tell me, no, the world's digital now, it's apps and everything. But I still, in my mind, in my heart, I was a magazine writer. Yeah. And I was having this conversation with how we should take the direction of, of Whiskey Advocate. And I was like, you know, I think people want more history. I think people want, want more insights into the science and the culture and all that. And he's like, you're wrong. He's like, I've been doing this for a long time and all people care about is, does it taste good? And he's like, that's it. And we went back and forth over it. This, this conversation happened in 2017. And seven years later, eight years later, whatever, whenever this comes out, I'll say Marvin was right. I've seen it in the views of everything from podcasts to YouTube to articles on, on Forbes where you could, see, and, and you see it in the lists. And I see it and when I'm interviewed, like how many times something gets shared when I say something's my five best, whatever. That's what people care about. Mm. And so that's where, that's where whiskey media is. And to me, this is even more dangerous than the TikToker. It's the bet, five bartender said these are the best. Mm. And so you have all of these like stories that are out there that are just lists that are not in any way, shape, or form have any kind of educational aspect to them. They're just like, this bourbon's smooth and tastes like blueberries. We call them listicles. <laughs> listicles yeah, that's the listicle yeah. engine. And exactly the, now they're is. written by chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, and it's it's interesting to watch this. And I don't know that it's necessarily been a shift because like when I started doing this, you know, I started off as like kind of a beat writer at Louisville.com and I was making like $3 an article. Oh, yeah. And I, I did a That's lot when we of listicles. originally listicle. interviewed you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. And I did a lot of listicles because, you know, like we had a, we had a competition. If we wanted to get a $100 bonus for the month, we had to have the highest performing story on the website that month. And the only time I got it was when I did just some bullshit top 10 list that I crapped out in 10 minutes, you know. And it's sad that clickbait as we call it is is really people have just shorter attention spans now in general yeah. i mean i think there are a lot of reasons for that i think we're probably the most stressed out as a society that we've ever been at this point in time and i i think it makes sense that we're looking for we want something to engage our minds but not 
too deeply, you know, and and so I, I see a lot of that. And a lot of it has also to do with algorithms. So the things that do well in algorithms on social media and Google and things like that are not necessarily things that are, you know, well, well done, well thought out, well researched. You know, it's something it's an off the cuff, you know, with incendiary sometimes title that that grabs people's attention. And, you know, that's that's something that I oftentimes find myself lamenting. You know, you'll have these beautiful works of history and research that are basically going unnoticed when, you know, somebody who knows shit about fuck is writing a top 10 list <laughs> about, you know, oh, the, the best whiskey is Fireball. Woohoo! You know, and and it's just like, oh, God, why? Why are we doing this to ourselves as a society? You know, like that makes me sad. Yeah. I mean, the listicles thing, it's it, as bad as it sounds like it. it but it's spans beyond bourbon it's like somebody just took the playbook that works it's like if i'm going to go right. visit toronto canada of course i'm going to go look at the top 10 list of things to go and visit yeah. in top toronto yeah. canada and so i think that's just the it's the nature of just what the the psyche and what we've just been accustomed to now well, and so i think you, there's so much information we're trying to simplify things in our mind it's like we're spending so much cognitive energy on yeah. so many things now it's like that top 10 just makes it easier. But yeah. as, as a writer or anyone in media, you can fight that and you can try to beat what the public wants or you can adapt and create something that fits within that model but still does not compromise what you want to deliver. And that's what I have done. And, and that's, you know, and I'll be honest with you. I've, talk, I've told you guys this story before about why I got into podcasting. I'm at Tales of the Cocktail and I'm ordering a drink and this guy comes up to me he's like, hey, are you Fred Minnick? And I'm thinking he's got, you know, he saw me with a book or one of my seminars or something. He's like, I, I recognize your voice from Bourbon Pursuit. And, wow. I, and I was like, I'm not surprised. That, <laughs> that was a moment. You guys put him on the map. <laughs> we really were. And I was like, that was the moment I began. And that happened around the same conversation at the same time when I was trying to think about what to do because the the thing that nobody wants to hear and they think we make a lot of money but being a writer or any kind of media period is absolutely awful you make yeah. you make close to nothing yep and if you're ethical you make you you do not make money and it's called a struggling artist for a reason yeah, yeah. and starving artist and so you have <laughs> starving to, artist thank you Ryan. yeah so like how do, the question was at that time was like how do I how do I support my family without working for a brand or doing something that is marketing centric for a brand so I always wanted to be independent I always want to right. keep everything right there and so I began to branch out into podcasting at that time I was beginning to branch out in events which would become my number one thing but the thing is you know, as a writer today, you cannot survive. You just cannot do it. And yeah. and I would I would say that I'm in that top I'm in the top, you know, two, three percent of writers in the world for for, you know, books out, books bought, things like that. And it's like it is to this day, it's like I could not just write. If I just if I, if I just wrote, I just wrote books and articles and stuff, I, I would not I would not be able to support my family. Right. I guess Maggie will kind of kick that over to you. So it's like uh, Fred said, you know, you gotta if you write and write and write. You know, you're also doing some stuff on like the award side. Is that the kind of trajectory you saw? Is like, okay, well, we got to get ourselves out of just, you know, putting pen to paper every single day. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's point-of-sale Go Mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award-winning 24-7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. 
Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase. And go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Yeah, you were also doing some stuff on like the award side. Is that the kind of trajectory you saw is like, okay, well, we got to get ourselves out of just, you know, putting pen to paper every single day? No, I mean, that was totally just dumb luck. You know, Fred recommended me to to judge World Whiskies one year and I just kept on doing it. And eventually they were like, hey, do you want to be the co-chair? And then I was like, okay. And then they they're like, broke down mm-hmm. and said, yeah. here you go, Maggie, come on. And then they're like, okay, you're going to be the chair now. And I'm like, oh, okay. And, you know, that's also something that I don't make a whole lot of money at, right? You know, like I have to do all these different things to be able to make enough money to justify my existence. (laughs) Literally, the amount of money that I'm making now is justifying my existence. And the reason I'm still doing this, like I'm hanging on by my fingernails, but, you know, I have two kids and... I need to be able to like take them to the orthodontist and take them to the dentist and take them here, you know, and for a long time I had a day job and I was doing this and it got to the point where like I would start working at seven o'clock in the morning. I would be working until midnight, like for days on end sometimes. And it got to be too much. And, you know, when I got through 2020, we moved, sold our house, bought a new house and moved and and kids were doing virtual learning and all that kind of stuff. And I was still doing the day job and the writing. And in the middle of, you know, buying a house, selling a house, moving, you know, homeschooling the kids basically more or less. And, you know, I got like major, major, major burnout. I mean, like I would basically crawl to my recliner on Friday night and I just would not move from that spot for days. And so I ended up quitting my day job and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to see how long I can make this writing thing last. I'm basically only doing the writing and the awards and, you know, whatever public appearances I can do, whatever events I can do. And I'm hanging on by my fingernails until my kids are out of school. So then I can, you know, refocus and figure out how to pay for college. Just tell them to go get a job. What are they? Those lazy bums, right? Well, my (laughs) my oldest started babysitting and uh, he he called me the other day. He's like, mom, I have to change a diaper. And I was like, I'll be right there. (laughs) Is this the one that went to school in shorts and like zero degrees? Yes, that's him. I was like, am I going to get a call from the school? And he was like, mom, they would have to call everybody's parents at the school. What is it with kids wanting to wear shorts in this weather? When it's zero degrees. I know. I'm like, honey, can I get you some sweatpants? I don't want pants. My other my other son won't wear shorts so he wears long pants in the summertime like to the beach he'll wear long pants i don't get it (laughs) you breed them differently that's yeah i know they're very different kids so when it comes down to the writing what have you kind of seen and we'll kind of focus on you know the magazine and stuff like that you know what have you seen as like stories that people really latch on to like what are the ones Mm. that aren't the listicles the the, the ones that are the ones that you know of course that make the, the headlines but the ones that kind of make people really think deeply or at least kind of engage with engage yeah. with or really kind of soak in the history like what have you found of those, his, those articles that really seem to hit well people want things that they can relate to or that they find inspiring in some way and i think a lot of the history can be that way if you're looking at the right parts of the history you know there are a lot of people who are just like oh it's all white men and blah blah you know and when you kind of challenge that that's when people start to get interested i think that there are enough people covering the white man history of of bourbon that that's not really something that a whole bunch of people need to continue to do i think that we're looking at other parts of the history. And, you know, one of the really unique things that's happened in the last probably four or five years, and Noah Rothbaum was actually the first person who pointed this out to me, we have greater access now to archives than we ever have, like in human history, because all these things are starting to come online. So like, if you have a question, there is an answer for it out there. So like deep dives into history, you know, like I'm, I've, I just did a a story about the history of the Fouquier, which is, you know, kind of a fun New Orleans centric cocktail. 
Um, and that's that's got what well, it's got bourbon, Armagnac, and a Dictine. Okay, yeah, it's like a little bit of everything and like two different kinds of bitters, and it's it's absolutely delicious. If you ever go to the Carousel Bar, you have to have a Vucre at the Carousel okay. Bar. Um, and the Vucre. <laughs> oh yeah, you have to have the Vucre at the Carousel Bar. It's like a whole thing, but you know it's really interesting because a lot of these cocktails, you know, we don't know the history of a lot of these or have not known the history of a lot of these things. And then Noah Rothbaum and and Dave Wondrich published that like compendium or or you know encyclopedia of the of Oxford guide. yeah the yeah. Oxford Guide yeah, and they really dug into a lot of the history because they've had access that they, that nobody had ever had before. And so that was a real you know a really big turning point for that type of information. Yep. So now you can go, okay, hmm, I wonder, you know, who invented XYZ or where this cocktail came from or, you know, who this person was. And there's so much information out there now that you can get a hold of that you could not get a hold of four or five years ago. So those deep dives into things that have not seen the light of day in a really long time are things that people connect with. And then, you know, another thing that I think has been really interesting is I did a story last year about becoming a Tennessee squire. And the way that that happened was my grandfather passed away and I had been with him, you know, pretty much every day in hospice. And I got up early one morning to go back to hospice and got the call from my Mima that, you know, he was gone. And so I was looking through a bin of his papers, trying to find a picture for his obituary. And I see Jack Daniel staring back at me. And I was like, this, this bin has like his Kentucky colonel certificate, his dad's Kentucky con- colonel certificate, his high school diploma, like pictures of his grandparents. And for some reason, Jack Daniel, you know, <laughs> and I was like, what is this? This is so absurd. And so I pulled it out and I snapped a picture of it. And I had never heard of the Tennessee Squires, you know, and I had been doing this for 10 years. Mm. And I was like, I, I don't know what this is. And so, you know, like I, I, sent the picture over to somebody on the comms team at Brown Forum. And I was like, what, what is this? And they're like, oh, it's like a super fan group. I was like, you know, like the mellow moments group for Jack Daniels. They're, they're like, yeah, basically like that. And so I ended up like going down there, figured out that I could transfer ownership of his plot of land at the, at the Jack Daniels distillery into my name and become a Tennessee squire. And, you know, I went down there and toured and and did the transfer and visited the the Motlow House, which is like kind of the world headquarters of of the Tennessee Squires Association. And so I did a story about that. And like so many people have come up to me like at the Bourbon Festival and, you know, different places that I've been. They're like, wow, I read that story about the Tennessee Squires. That's so cool. That's so amazing, you know. And so stories like that that really bring a personal element, I think, into the story, I think really connect with people. So, yeah, I mean, there there are a lot of different ways to find those stories that nobody has told yet or nobody's telling yet. And that's really what I think gets people to connect. What about like bourbon tourism or I guess, you know, writing stories about visiting here? It seems like that, I don't know, with friends, they'll say like, oh, I read Travel Leisure and they had this bourbon experience. Yeah. It, you know, it, a lot of people want to come here. There's a lot of interest in that. Is there, do you see that as well or? So, I mean, that's how I cut my teeth, right? Like, I basically started off as a bourbon beat writer, and I went to all the events. I went to, you know, Fred was gracious enough to invite me to all of his Legend series in in those early days. And, you know, Michael Veach invited me to all of his programs that he was doing when he was with the Filson. And so, you know, like I covered a lot of events and and tourism type things. I did a lot of listicles about like 10 places to go in a Louisville weekend, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so like, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of interest in that. And I think really a lot of interest in things that are outside of Kentucky or outside of the, you know, the usual suspects. One thing that's changed a lot since I started doing this is you can spend a week in Louisville and never run out of bourbon things to do. That's true. I mean, when I first started doing this, the Evan Williams experience had just opened and was really the only distillery like inside the city limits of Louisville that offered tours. So, you know, now we've got what, like eight or 10 just in downtown Louisville. So, and actually that's probably more now because I think like three or four, you know, you guys opened up and then Bardstown Bourbon Company opened up. So it's probably like 12 now. Yeah. Um, just, and there's just, always something every single weekend. There's oh, yeah. things like kind of festival or some sort of event. Totally. Or, charitable auction or something. And people reach out to me all the time and they're like, hey, I'm coming to Louisville this weekend and I can't get into any distilleries. What do I do? And so I like have to plan people's vacations for them on, <laughs> on the fly, like pretty free, like with alarming frequency. I have a call this afternoon that I'm doing this, as a matter of fact. I hope um, you're charging. 
No, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I, I think it's good for all of us, you know, if if people are, are interested. And what I don't want to see happen is I don't want people to show up here and be like, I can't get into anything. Why? Why would I ever come? Nobody should ever come here because you can't do anything. You know, like, I don't want to see that happen. And so, like, I'll run into people on the street and they're like, hey, we just tried to get into this distillery and they can't. And I'm like, I'll give them Stephen Yates's number at the Fraser. I'm like, go to the Fraser. Ask for Stephen Yates and he'll do, you know, like a personal bourbon tasting with you. And, you know, like I just I don't want people to come here and be like, oh, I can't get into anything. Why would I come here again? You know, but yeah, I mean, there there's a lot of interest in in things to do and stuff like that. And golly, I wish I could get people to pay me to write about it. Still. <laughs> <laughs> Need some more ads on 502girl.com. Was it 502? Blue Girl 502. Blue Girl yeah. 502. You know, yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was a fever dream I came up with like 10 years ago, and it just kind of stuck. So here we are. Yeah, yeah. No, that's awesome. Like, I think there's a, there's been a lot of good trajectory on where it's going, what you've been able to build inside of whiskey writing. And I guess let's, let's kind of go a little doom and gloom real quick as well. So- Let's kind of talk about the idea of of where do you see the problem being with short form content? Is it because, and I think Fred might have hinted it earlier, is that like anybody that buys a couple of bottles of bourbon all of a sudden thinks they're a bourbon expert because they can not only buy some bottles, but also put on a ring light and go on TikTok live. Do you see that as being kind of a, a big cause for concern as we start getting, as we, I guess you could say diluting of what people considered as were, were experts at one point? Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely so I I feel like there was this article maybe eight or 10 years ago, the death of expertise. And I'm vaguely recalling some of the details of it. But yeah, it was that kind of thing where it's like people have greater access to be able to share their their thoughts and opinions that are maybe well informed, maybe not. And so that has been something that I've been contending with the entire time that I've I've been doing this because like anybody can start a podcast, anybody can go on TikTok, anybody can, you know, do an Instagram story or or whatever. And, you know, for a lot of for a lot of things that's been a good thing because it brings new people into the fold all the time. And then once they're in the fold, then they find people like Fred and people like you all and, and people like me. So that part of it, I'm not necessarily super concerned about. It is kind of funny. I've had a few like laughable moments where people have been like, oh, I'm going to listen to this booth babe over here because she's clearly the expert, not you. And I'm like, OK, you know, have a nice day. Enjoy yourself, whatever. And so like the people who are enthusiasts who are, you know, wanting to be a part of this, I I think it's usually a pretty good thing. I mean, I think that the, a lot of them don't really understand the confines in which they're supposed to be operating. You know, people don't understand things like we were talking about earlier with the FCC rules about disclosing if you've taken any monetary compensation or anything like that. A lot of people just don't understand, you know, th- those types of rules. And, and sometimes they learn, sometimes they don't. The bigger problem that I see is with so many people being in the space. You know, every time that a brand or, you know, whatever puts on, you know, some sort of media program or something, it's like, where do you draw that line? Does it need to all be like, quote unquote, serious media? Or can it be, you know, some media people, some influencers, you know, and there are a lot of influencers that I think are doing a really great job. Hood Smollier is at the top of that list. I think he's fabulous. Jack. Yeah, Yeah, Jack and Jack Begadoo. And I'm always happy to see him whenever I'm doing an sort of media things. But, you know, the other side of it is sometimes they don't know how to differentiate the things that they're asking of us. So on a couple of of occasions, I've gotten some pretty like almost borderline nasty demands from from PR folks saying, you know, we would like to invite you to this event with the understanding that you will provide coverage and you'll provide social media and you'll, you know, capture content and it has to hit this many metrics and we need to see what your metrics are for this. And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like my Instagram following isn't Best that of there. luck to you, sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I, I think that part of it is that a lot of the PR folks, unless they're like really super specialized in what they're doing and understanding like the differences in, in who they're talking to and who they're dealing with, it can be 
kind of hairy dealing with somebody who doesn't understand those those delineations. And then, you know, the other 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 part of this is that a lot of the funding that would go to support like a magazine or whatever is getting diluted. A lot of those advertising dollars are being used to pay influencers because they can control that messaging better. And then, you know, that means that there are fewer opportunities for people like me to write something that is well researched and well thought out because, you know, the advertising dollars are going to something, you know, it's it's a scarcity mentality is what's happening right now is what I'm seeing this, the shift from this abundance mindset where, you know, when I first started doing this, it was like, oh, yeah, we'll let anybody in here ask any questions that you want, you know, take all the pictures that you want, you know, like post whatever you want or don't post or whatever. We don't care. We're just glad that you're here. Because they understood that when people got in and they got, you know, got to look around and got a feel for what was going on, that that would inform coverage going forward. It wasn't necessarily like a one to one ratio. And now they're like, well, we have this advertising spend and we have to prove, you know, we have to prove, you get your ROI on it. Yeah, yeah. We, you got to get your ROI. You have to, you know, make everybody see how hard you're working and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it's it's more like, well, we'll invite you to this if. Or, you know, we would love to have you if you can guarantee. So it's more of a scarcity mentality where it's like instead of everybody come, everybody's welcome, you know, which is like what kind of got us to where we are now with the popularity of bourbon. Now it's like, well, we have this thing and we have to be afraid that it's going to end. So we have to guard it really closely. So, yeah. Yeah. I guess another kind of follow up on that is is a lot of the stuff that gets covered in magazines and podcasts and top tens and whatever, you know, a lot of it is all coming from seven major distilleries. Sure. Do they even need us anymore? To the fact that it's like, is it up to us to change the narrative and saying, well, let's talk about other people. Let's talk about other brands that could use the exposure because it's, I mean, I don't know the last four roses has never thrown us a dollar in marketing. Brown form has never thrown us a dollar in marketing and we still end up talking about them. Yeah. And, and maybe it's one of those things. It's like, well, maybe we, maybe we don't talk about them. I don't know. Well, I, it's what the consumers want. Yeah. It's, it's what your audience wants. And look, man, you, you don't have to go very far to, to see the analytics of your craft whiskey reviews Versus the Buffalo Trace Antique collection. Yeah, like, I'm very sure. Very sure. Yeah. The proof is in the is is in the numbers. Absolutely. So I you gotta have a balance. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there's still plenty of interesting stuff to talk about when you're talking about the legacy distillers because you know, like, there's so much history that's still being uncovered with a lot of these brands. And, you know, like I did more coverage of Jack Daniels in the last year than I ever have done in the entire 10 years that I've been doing this because I had that connection. And there is a lot of really interesting history there. You know, there you can delve into the whole is is Jack Daniels a bourbon argument. Got to like some good content. <laughs> people go absolutely Ape shit about that. Yeah. I mean, everybody has very strong feelings about that. So there's always stuff to talk about there and there's always additional history to uncover. So that was one of the things that I actually asked a, a table full of Brown Foreman execs, you know, tell me your thoughts on this. And they all had very strong opinions on it. And then you know, like a few months later, Michael Veach wrote something on his blog, go to bourbonbeach.com and, and look at has Jack Daniels lost its pride. And that blew up the Internet. And there was an exec from the Jack Daniels brand team who actually posted a public comment going through like point by point why he believed that Michael Veach was wrong in his assessment. And so that's something, you know, there, there are always those kind of nuggets for the legacy distillers and the legacy brands that, you know, there's there's a lot of arguments that aren't settled. There's a lot of history that hasn't been brought to light yet. And there's always something interesting going on. A lot of it, I feel like, you know, they're they're chasing that never ending. 24 hour news cycle. Like the number of press releases that I get for new whiskey releases is exhausting. Every like week. sometimes yep. I just want to crawl into a hole and die, you know? <laughs> and well, um, we wouldn't have a Friday show if that was the case. So right, yeah, I know. I mean, like, thank God for people like you. Like, I'm glad I'm glad that they send me these things so that I know what's out there. But like sometimes when it gets to the point where they're like, hey, do you have any interest in covering this? I'm like, no. 
I do not. But thank have I ever like but thank you for asking. Thank you for sending it. But, you know, like I think outside of the constant churn of new releases, there's still interesting stuff to talk about. But then there's also a lot of stuff to talk about that has been happening in the the craft side of things. You know, like I was sitting in on the ACSA yearly briefing last week. And there are a couple of numbers that I like to get from those when I sit in on those. And one of those is the number of distillers in the United States. So when I started doing this 10 years ago, there were maybe what, like 70 distilleries in the entire United States. And now there's like, so last year it was 3,400. This year, I think it's 4,100 DSPs in the United States, which is just absolutely crazy what to think about, you know, but we're living in a time where you no longer have to come to Kentucky to experience whiskey. You know, everybody's within an hour or two drive of a distillery just about wherever they are. And I think that's a really interesting thing. And a lot of these distilleries have now been around for 10, 12, 15 years. So they're really coming into their own as far as like making a high quality product and, you know, making an impact on the overall marketplace. So, you know, like there's, it's about, it's a constant balancing act, right? Because you want to have those stories that your readers connect with because they have that brand loyalty or that experience that they've had in the past. But then you also want to say like, hey, here's this other thing you should pay attention to. And we still want you to come to Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, absolutely. Don't want you to come there. We're not deterring you. Well, and what I tell people now is like, you should start off by exploring your own backyard. And then when you get a feel for the process and when you get bitten by that bug, you know, then you plan your trip to Kentucky, you know, because that's like your your trip to the the Holy Land, basically. And I hope when people do that, it's going to make folks in Kentucky try harder. Like yeah. You, can't, you just can't get away with doing the regular 51% corn tour. Yeah. Well, and I think that a lot of I, I think that a lot of distilleries have really upped the bar on their tours. I remember the first tour that I went to in was at Maker's Mark. My oldest, who is now 16, was in a stroller. And so I was pushing him around the distillery in a stroller. And, you know, it was it was interesting. But like now, every time I go to Maker's Mark, there's something different, you know, and even with as much history and as as much historical preservation as they're doing, they're always upping the ante, which I think is really smart. And a lot of the distilleries in Kentucky have done that, I've found. Yeah, very cool. Well, I mean, this has been great to kind of dive into your history once again of writing and kind of seeing like where the path trajectory is going to go and sort of like what are the things that could be the potential pitfalls that folks need to start looking out for as well and and to always kind of go back to tried and true and knowing when good journalism stands out and knowing what a good story really is like too so thank you again for coming on the show thanks for having me yeah Yeah, good seeing you yeah so people want to follow you read more about your your articles where can they do that i'm pretty much everywhere at lugirl 502 so twitter and facebook and blue sky and yada 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 lugirl 502.com is my my blog and I'm on American Whiskey Magazine, and I just started writing for Bourbon Plus and Covey Rise and so on and so forth. And always check out Michael Veach's blog, Bourbon Veach. I, I built that, and I run it, and it's it's always a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Michael didn't know how to start a website. Was that how that came from? It, it was, yeah. So I kept, I kept <laughs> I was going to say that's an understatement, probably. Yeah, no. <laughs> he didn't even have a smartphone when I first met him. Yeah. And so, like, I kept running into him. He would invite me, you know, to all of his events. And I'd be like, hey, do you have a website? Because, you know, I'd always link to the Filson or point people to the Filson. But, but I'd be like, you oh, know, I want people to know you, too. And he's like, oh, it's on the list. It's on the list. And finally, I was like, can I just build you a website? It'll take me, like, three hours. <laughs> so <laughs> I went over a to... Writer. Yeah, <laughs> he was to lit probably wrote his first book on well, a typewriter I spoke in a I pipe. Guess. yeah exactly exactly driving around in his jeep with a typewriter yeah but yeah i went over to his house sat down at his kitchen table and i was like bloop 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 bloop, bloop. here you go here's your website and he's like okay and then a couple weeks went by and he hadn't put anything on it and i was like do you need me to show you how to use it he was like <laughs> can you just do it for me and i was like sure Sure, I'll just do it for you. you. (laughs) Love it. Well, Maggie, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's always good to have a friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. That that knows about whiskey that's been around here for a while. And Fred, thank you so much for sharing some of your war stories as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. time. Well, like I said, make sure you go follow Maggie, follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your podcasts, uh, subscribe, download, share with a friend, because we're not all about top 10 lists over here either. We like to get really into the, the long form content and deep, mm-hmm. deep conversation. Deep, deep people. It, it really is. It truly is. But with that, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next time. Doodles. Baca sucks. Bye.